Hello and welcome to Bio Lessons to Go. I'm Mr. Dove, and today we'll be examining DNA comparison and analysis. Comparing DNA from different people or different organisms has many valuable purposes. Uh, for, exa for example, in forensics, to be able to use um, DNA comparisons to identify elements of a crime scene. Um, in fact, uh, we have um, a database of uh, DNA information that allows for this called CODIS, the Combined DNA Index System. We can use DNA uh, comparisons to do medical diagnoses, uh, determine paternity, um, and even establish evolutionary relationships. Now, the most common way to, deter to compare DNA is by using what's called a DNA fingerprint. Now, this process was invented um, at the University of Lancaster in 1985 by a gentleman by the name of Alec Jeffries. Um, so this is actually a, a relatively recent technique. Now when we think of fingerprints, we usually think of um, those that are at the tips of our fingers. Um, those arches and those loops and whirls that allow us to distinguish individuals. Well, a DNA fingerprint allows us to distinguish between organisms using their DNA um, because our DNA is unique and each individual is going to have a different uh, DNA fingerprint. Now, the modern method of making a DNA fingerprint is called restriction, fragment, length, polymorphism analysis which is a whole mouthful. Basically, what it, what it boils down to is we're going to cut DNA into fragments. And so we're going to have DNA cut into little tiny pieces. So you would have your DNA strand, and we're going to actually cut it into pieces. And then the pieces have many different sizes, many uh, shape. So they're going to have lots of different fragments and then we're going to compare those. We're going to analyze those cut fragments. Now the first step to producing a DNA fingerprint is we have to break down the cells so that we can get the DNA out. So you might remember the activity that we did in class where we took the DNA out of our strawberries and so we first have to extract that DNA so that we can have access to it. Now sometimes, uh, especially at crime scenes, you're only going to get a small amount of DNA. If we have a few skin cells, you know, um, on a cigarette butt, um, we're only going to have a small amount of that DNA. And so in order to analyze it, we are going to need to amplify it. We're going to need to make lots and lots of copies. Now the process that we use to take a small amount of DNA and get enough so that we can actually uh, analyze it is called polymerase chain reaction or PCR. So we put our small sample of uh, DNA into what's called a thermocycler and inside that um, thermocycler we're going to have the DNA nucleotides that we want, you know, the important A's, T's, C's, and G's to add to our small sample, and enzymes like polymerase that's going to add new bases um, to our small amount of DNA. So the first thing we do is we increase the temperature of our sample, and what that's going to do is it's going to cause the, the, double fran the double stranded DNA to separate. Then we cool that sample and that allows for the new bases to be added um, to our newly um, separated DNA strands. And then we warm it up just a little bit to allow those fragments to kind of come back together. And so then we've actually copied that DNA. And by doing this, running it through multiple um, times, we're going to be able to copy and copy millions of copies of those DNA fragments you know over just a few hours.
Once we have enough uh, of the DNA to work with, we're going to cut the DNA into small pieces, um, into what we call restriction fragments, using special DNA scissors called restriction enzymes. So these restriction enzymes, uh, they're like DNA scissors. They're going to be used um, for cutting the DNA into small pieces. So the number of fragments that we're going to get from different people are going to be different. Um, because your DNA sequence is different, um, the enzyme is going to cut wherever it finds that specific cutting sequence. So for example, if we have um, some DNA scissors that recognizes the sequence GGATCC, in this first species, we're going to get one, two, three, four cuts, and that's going to give us three fragments. But species B has slightly different uh, DNA sequence, so it only has three places where the enzyme is going to cut, and so we're going to get two fragments. And so when we uh, separate these fragments for comparison, we will determine that these species are very different from each other in their DNA because their fragments are different. And so that's where that idea of restriction fragments, they're called restriction fragments because they're fragments, they're pieces that come from being restricted, from being cut by that enzyme, and they have length polymorphisms. They have different lengths. So to be able to visualize, to be able to get those fragments, we need to be able to separate those fragments. We separate the fragments using a technique called gel electrophoresis. The gel, um, the DNA rather, is going to be placed into a gelatin-like substance. They're going to be injected into little wells that's in um, a gel that's made from algae. It's called agarose gel. And this gel is going to allow for us to separate um, those fragments. It's called electrophoresis because we're going to have an electrical current applied, which is going to help the DNA to separate. The reason why the okay. DNA is going to separate is because DNA is negatively charged. Remember that DNA has a sugar phosphate backbone? Well, those phosphates are negative, so DNA is a negative molecule. And so it's going to move along our um, gel. Um, since DNA is negative, then it's going to move towards the positive end because opposites attract. So our DNA fragments are going to move through the gel. It's like the little fragments are going to be swimming through the jello. Now the shorter fragments are going to move the furthest. Um, they're able to get through the small spaces in the gel. Um, and so the smallest fragments are going to move furthest. They're going to move uh, closest to the positive end, whereas the largest fragments are going to stay up near the negative. So uh, our Large fragments will be up near the origin where we started, and the small fragments are going to move the farthest through the gel. Now the final step of DNA fingerprinting is that we need to be able to visualize those fragments, and the DNA is not going to be visible when we get started. Um, and so there's two techniques to make that um, those DNA fragments visible. Uh, one is going to be using um, radioactive uh, probes to create um, an image uh, where we've got um, using an x-ray plate to be able to create the image and the other is going to be using a dye. So in our first technique we're going to uh, add radioactive segments of DNA, little radioactive probes to our DNA. And the way that we do that is um, our DNA, first, it has to 
be blotted off onto a uh, nitrocellulose membrane. Basically, it's uh, the same kind of consistency as ladies' hosiery. Um, and so we're going to blot our DNA onto this hose. And once we have that onto our, our nitrocellulose membrane, we place that um, in a solution that has radioactive um, DNA probes that are going to attach to sequences of the DNA. We then place that with an x-ray plate and wherever that that probe was we're going to get these bands and that's what's going to allow us to see um, the DNA because it, the radioactive probes are going to develop on that x-ray plate. This is called a southern blot method. Another way that you can do it is by using a dye. We've got lots of dyes now um, that actually uh, will fluoresce under ultraviolet light and then that allows us to see the DNA um, and see those fragments. Um, this particular um, image here I actually produced. This is um, a DNA fingerprint of um, a tomato plant that was on my back porch. So there's a lot of different uses for uh, this comparison. For example, we can compare the DNA samples from different organisms to determine their evolutionary relationship. So if we were to compare all of these organisms, we see that organism 3 and organism 4, um, they have a lot of DNA in common. They've got lots with only one little difference. So um, over here is kind of like a family tree for those organisms. And so that tells us that the rat and the squirrel, they have a lot in common. They have a perhaps a recent common ancestor. Similarly, um, the turtle and the rat, uh, sorry, the turtle and the snake, they also have a lot in common just one perhaps sequence difference and so they have a common ancestor and the one that's the most different that has the least in common is going to be our fruit fly which makes sense because his ancestor to the rest is way further back in time we can use DNA fingerprinting in medical diagnosis uh, we can compare a normal allele with a diseased allele to be able to determine the many differences that that mutation has uh, produced in that particular allele. And so then when we analyze uh, individuals who may have something say like a Huntington's disease, we can then um, determine that that disease is present. We can compare the um, their allele um, to these known differences and be able to diagnose them with that disease even if they're asymptomatic, even though even if they're not showing any of the symptoms. And then of course we can use it in forensics uh, to compare DNA samples from crime scenes to the suspects. So here we've got our crime scene and we've got our victim and we use that so we can eliminate her, his or her DNA from the crime scene sample. And so if we look at our suspects, suspect one doesn't seem to add up. Oh, but look, suspect two, he shares this band. Up, oh, he shares all. So he matches with the crime scene. So we can say that suspect two is very likely um, the suspect, the individual that perpetrated the crime. So DNA uh, profiling, DNA fingerprinting, comparing DNA is a really useful tool in science. Um, very recent tool and we're, we're still finding ways to innovate and improve this process.